This is our third year, and this is uh, something new and unique for us. And we have someone who knows a lot more about horses than I do, but some of you know probably. Uh, I'll, I'll know when I'm supposed to growl. Oh. So uh, our friend uh, Chris Peeler is here. He uh, is a playwright. He has a, uh, a degree from Columbia University as a playwright and a lot of other work. He lives in Los Angeles, originally from Pittsburgh. And uh, I've heard part of this story, but to tell you any part of it that applies to this evening would kind of ruin it. In fact, I heard the middle part of it. Actually. So welcome, Chris Peel. Thank you guys so much for coming out. The first time I ever saw Adam Ant, I thought he was going to kill me. Just to be clear, I'm not talking about A-D-A-M Ant, the 80s rocker who sang Goody Two Shoes, although he was pretty scary too. I'm talking about a skittish white pony named A-T-O-M Ant after a 1960s cartoon superhero. It was 1980. I was nine years old and I was at a horse show in Saxonburg, Pennsylvania where Adam Ant was cantering around the ring in a pony hunter competition. In hunters, the pony is judged on how elegantly he moves and how well he jumps over a course of eight fences. It's like hurdles on horseback, except it's not a race. The goal is to make everything look smooth and effortless. But Doug Spink, the boy who was riding Adam, was kicking and shaking his reins to make Adam go faster and faster. Doug was too big and too heavy for Adam, so when he leaned in like a motorcycle rider as he went around a corner between one jump and another, Adam lost his balance and smashed to the ground, hooves flailing. As he scrambled to his feet, his eyes rolled back and I could see the white parts. When he stood up, he snorted and pawed at the ground. Then he trotted straight at the open gate of the ring, right where I was standing. I froze and pictured him running right over me, hooves pummeling me, leaving me bloodied and broken. Then someone closed the gate and my life was saved. <laughs> but back then, I couldn't help imagining the worst case scenario. It was just how my brain worked. My brain also told me to tell people that I was from Mars. <laughs> now this idea could have come from an obsession with alien planets that a lot of boys in their single digits have. It also could have come from the fact that riding in the back of my parents' tan Dodge station wagon as we drove around my hometown of Pittsburgh, I would often so spot signs for a town called Mars. <laughs> Mars, Pennsylvania. You've been there. When I mentioned my home on the red planet, most people just laughed but not my granddaddy. When I said to him, granddaddy, I was born on Mars. He just nodded and asked, what's it like there? <laughs> and we were off for as long as I felt like chatting. He asked me about what Martians ate, how they traveled from one planet to another, and how they managed to survive in an atmosphere that as far as earthlings like him knew, didn't have much oxygen. The answers as it turned out were peanut butter, flying saucers, and extra lungs. <laughs> Granddaddy lived in Pauley's Island, South Carolina, with his wife, a fiery redhead named Granny. <laughs> I only saw them in the summer, so for me, Granddaddy was a human vacation. He never talked about himself, so I only learned later that he was also a chemical engineer who helped invent Teflon. And a gambler who had won his mahogany dining table in a poker game. <laughs> I did know that he was a devoted and methodical bird watcher. I loved to look at the pictures in his bird books, which had catchy titles like the Illustrated Field Guide to the Finches of the Southeastern United States. <laughs> but if I spent too much time flipping through the pages, he would hand me his binoculars and suggest some field work. If you really want to understand a bird, he said, you have to hold still, be quiet, 
and just watch it for as long as it'll let you. <laughs> After a lifetime of smoking, granddaddy died of lung cancer. It was the first time someone I knew had died. At the lunch after his funeral, I said to my mom, I'm never going to smoke. That way I won't die. <laughs> That's not exactly how it works, she said. Well, how does it work? But there was a knock at the door, and she was gone before she could explain. Not long after Granddaddy died, I started having terrible trouble falling asleep. This was not your usual I'm afraid of monsters problem. Although the fact that my closet door never closed completely did suggest that there was a witch in there. <laughs> my sleep issue was that I would lie in bed and my inner monologue would escalate instantly from, oh, I'm not sleepy, to, if I fall asleep, I will be in total blackness like the total blackness of death. Oh, God, I don't want to die. If I don't sleep, I won't die. <laughs> my mom did what she could to help. I remember her sitting on the edge of my bed saying, okay, just start with your toes. Just let your toes relax. So heavy and warm, they're sinking into the bed. And we would do this sinking into the bed thing for my feet, legs, stomach, arms, and neck. But when we got to my head, in that instant before I dropped off, the death panic would come whooshing back and I would be wide awake until dawn. Oh, and I became terrified of Christmas. <laughs> I have a vivid memory of lying awake on December 24th, picturing all the presents piled under the tree. I was vibrating with the urge to rip open the wrapping paper and see what was hidden inside, but my parents had told me to absolutely not go downstairs until 6 a.m. So I lay there. And I got to thinking about how Christmas worked. You had a tree surrounded by precious, precious presents, and kids confined to their rooms, and exhausted parents sleeping the deepest sleep of the year. <laughs> it occurred to me that this was the perfect setup for a burglar. <laughs> so Christmas Eve was torture. I was desperate to go downstairs, but too scared to move, willing my ears to open extra wide to hear the sound of thieves breaking a window or picking a lock to come in and steal our presents and the ornaments we had made and our cats. <laughs> The next morning, I managed to open my new chemistry set, but I was too worn out to create a single explosion. <laughs> my mom decided it was time for me to see a therapist. <laughs> so off I went to weekly sessions with Dr. Tabachnik. And I loved therapy. I got to eat as many Starbursts and Jolly Ranchers as I wanted. I got to play as much Nerf basketball as I wanted. And Dr. Tabachnik was a solid rebounder who never blocked my shots like my brother Michael did. Ooh. Michael was three years older than me, but they were three big years. And back then, he was more like a JV dad to me than a brother. This was partly because Michael was protective and partly because my dad was busy being a professor, consultant, expert witness, and functional alcoholic. <laughs> For decades, the only beverages I saw my dad drink were black coffee and Budweiser. <laughs> he was always willing to watch or play football, and he was never a violent drunk, but after a few beers, he would slur and glower until he fell asleep in front of the television. So. On nights when he wasn't working late, I had a simple rule. Once the fierce first beer was open, avoid dad. Of course, I never talked about that to Dr. Tabachnik. Anytime he asked me about my family, I would just turn away and do this. I did this when I was nervous. I also did this when I was thinking, so you can imagine how popular I was in school. <laughs> Every time a new teacher saw me picking away, she would go, yes, Mr. Peeler? Oh, oh, I'm not raising my hand. Do you have an itch? No, I'm fine. And of course, fourth graders had a field day with this. One of them wrote a poem about me. Chris Peeler is so kind, so very, very nice, to make a home for all those lice. I didn't have lice, but the truth was almost as gross. When I was a baby, I had cradle cap, which is basically dandruff for kids. It got kind of crusty. And my mom would 
sit me on her lap and gently pick it off. When the cradle cap went away, my mom stopped picking and I started. I still find myself doing this two or three times a day. Dr. Tabachnik tried to get me to stop by showing me what I looked like in a mirror, but that just made me avoid mirrors. <laughs> the only time I could guarantee that I wouldn't pick my head is when I was wearing a riding helmet. My brother Michael and I started taking riding lessons when I was eight, and within a couple of months, we were both going to shows, winning ribbons, and spending as much time as we could at the barn. So a couple of weeks before my 10th birthday, when my mom asked, as she did every year, and still does, what would you like for your birthday? I was ready. I had been taught to be polite no matter what, so I said, well, been riding for about two years now, and I'm doing pretty well at the shows, so I'd like a pony, please. <laughs> and Michael, with the devastating sarcasm of a 13-year-old, said, yeah, and I'd like a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> and such was Michael's power in my mind that that was the end of the discussion. I would never get a pony. But I did. For my 10th birthday, my mom bought me a pony. She paid for him with a student loan check. <laughs> I hope nobody here works for Sally Mae. <laughs> she did pay them back, though, and she did go on to get that second master's degree and become a widely published academic author, so I think we're OK. We were not the kind of family you would expect to own ponies. We lived in the city, in a neighborhood where getting mugged was less a crime and more a rite of passage. <laughs> and the only old money we had was a lucky fennig that my oma had sewn into the lining of her skirt when she and opa fled the Nazis to live in New Jersey. But my mom did what it took to buy me a pony, even if it meant she was the only parent who drove to the barn in a decommissioned police car. <laughs> and did I mention that my birthday pony was a surprise? Even Michael, who always knew where the Christmas presents were hidden, and one year actually forced me to look at mine so I wouldn't have any surprises either. <laughs> Even Michael kept the secret. So, Michael, Mom, and I drove 15 miles to the barn on my 10th birthday, just like we did most weekends. I walked in the door, and standing in the stall in front of me, with a blue bow around his neck, was Adam Ant. <laughs> In the Hollywood version of this story, we would have locked eyes and formed a silent bond that could never be broken. <laughs> but this was real life, and my birthday present was a 650-pound animal that terrified me, even standing still in a stall. So I turned to my mom and said, why did Doug leave his pony here? She smiled and pointed at the sign on the door that said, Happy Birthday, Chris. Not knowing what else to do, I chose to hold still, be quiet, and just watch Adam. He was white, but because he had some tiny black markings on his nose and brown flecks on his ankles, the rules of horse color naming dictated that he was officially gray. English riding, like my other great childhood love, Dungeons and Dragons is governed by a ton of rules. For example, Adam was four feet three inches tall, but in the riding world he was 12 three. The 12 being hands. A hand is a four inches, right? It's a unit of measurement based on the width of a man's hand because in the old days when two people disagreed about how tall a horse was, they would each put a hand in and then they would measure like this. And whoever ended up on top got to keep the horse. That's not true. <laughs> Speaking of things that aren't true, can I just debunk a weirdly persistent equine myth? A pony is not a baby horse. There are lots of breeds of ponies and lots of breeds of horses, and none of them will grow up to become each other. <laughs> saying a pony is a baby horse is like saying a chameleon is a baby crocodile. Just not true. Sorry, I get riled up about that stuff. Oh, for showing purposes, Ponies are classified like fast food sodas, small, <laughs> medium, and large. Adam was a medium pony, four feet three inches tall, and burly but not fat. He was built like a rugby player with hooves. <laughs> Up close, 
I could see that he was one of those lucky animals, like dolphins and some cats, whose mouths are formed in a permanent smile. My study about him was interrupted by the arrival of Doug Spink, who couldn't wait to take the bow off Adam's neck so I could go for a ride. Now, as someone who rode English, I was used to riding in a sand or grass ring surrounded by a fence. You walk, trot, and canter inside this big rectangle. It's all very disciplined and controlled. At this stable, though, the ring was under construction. What they did have was a big open field. <laughs> so I got on Adam, and Mom and Michael and the Sphinx walked me down to this big open field. And it felt nice riding my pony. When everybody got gathered to watch, I gave a little squeeze with my legs, and Adam broke into a trot. Barely a trot. More like a mosey. <laughs> so far, so good. And then I clucked. Just that. Now, in human horse communication, clucking generally means speed up a little. But Doug had apparently taught Adam that it means gallop right now. Because Adam took off like a racehorse across this wide open field. I thumped back in the saddle and lost my stirrup, which banged against Adam's ribs, making him run flat out, tossing his head and huffing through his nostrils. This is what we in the hunter world called being a little fresh. <laughs> in the ring, I would have known exactly what to do. If your pony takes off and you can't slow him down with the reins, you run him into the fence. And he has to stop. But I had no fence. Only acres of open field and one stirrup. Oh, and I also had my entire family watching my birthday present run away with me. I tugged on the reins, which Doug had apparently taught Adam to mean, kick it into six gear. Clearly, we weren't going to stop. So I decided to focus my energy on getting that stirrup back. Of course, in poking around with my foot, I managed to kick Adam in the ribs a few times, which in any language means speed up and maybe froth at the mouth a little. <laughs> After what seemed like forever, but was probably about 20 seconds, I got the stirrup back. I was not going to die this day after all. <laughs> and I was galloping for the first time. Galloping is unlike anything else. During each stride, there's a moment when all the pony's feet are off the ground at once. So for just an instant, the two of you are actually flying. I was thrilled and terrified at the same time. I'm sure the Germans have a word for that. <laughs> Long, <laughs> Long after the exhilaration wore off, Adam was still barreling along. So I tried every emergency stopping trick that I knew. I did the seesaw, where you tug on one rein and then the other. I did the hunter's cross, where you cross the reins and actually push down on the pony's neck. We were still galloping. When you get run away with, <laughs> there's always a moment when you believe that you will never stop. I reached that point. So I would like to say that what I did next was smart horsemanship, but really it was resignation. I relaxed my death grip on the reins and gave Adam his head. As soon as he felt the tension leave my hands, Adam slowed to a canter, and then a trot, and then a weird prancy gait. <laughs> I patted his neck and said, ho oh, and easy, over and over. And he actually walked. We were alive. <laughs> My mom walked jogged over, looking even paler than usual. What happened, she said. And hanging my head, I said, I clucked. <laughs> when you're riding every day, you cluck a lot. Your brain just gets wired to cluck any time you want something to move a little bit faster. I clucked at traffic on the 93 highway coming up here. <laughs> Let me just say, though, people don't like being clucked at. I learned this the hard way when I clucked at my first girlfriend in college. A burly girl from Bowling Green, Ohio, who I was desperate to lose my virginity to. Now, we were getting ready to go out to dinner, and I was sitting on her bed as she was lingering over the choice of a sweater. 
Now, the faster we chose a sweater and got to dinner, the faster we could move on to other things. So without thinking, I went <laughs> <laughs> and every molecule of air left the room. She turned on me and said, what did you say? I said, what does that mean? I, I don't know, nothing. Is that some kind of chicken noise? <laughs> no. She put her hands on my shoulders. I was suddenly very aware that she was stronger than me. <laughs> what does it mean? I hoped that the truth might set me free. So I said, um, go faster, pony? I did not lose my virginity that night. Now, the horses and ponies where Adam lived had it pretty good. Weather permitting, they spent most of their time in a hilly pasture where they could eat the grass, roll in the dirt, or just generally look picturesque. So the first time I went to the barn, knowing that Adam would be there, he was out in this field. I took his halter and lead rope from where they were hanging on the fence, and I approached him slowly and steadily, and from his left side, just like I had been taught. Oh, about equine vision. If you want to see the world the way a horse does, put your hand here. Go ahead, try it. Because of the position of their eyes, horses cannot see directly in front of themselves. So one of the first lessons I learned was never to come straight at a horse. You can put your hand down. Or you can watch the rest of the show in pony vision. <laughs> So I made sure Adam could see me, and I was a step and a half away when he tossed his head and trotted away. I figured I must have spooked him, so when I approached him again, I started talking. Hi, Adam. Good boy. Come here. And I got three feet away, and again he took off. This time cantering. Clearly, this was a game to him. Maybe something else that Doug Spink, who I was liking less and less as time went by, had taught him. <laughs> the third time, I got the halter wrapped around his head, but I fumbled with the buckle. And off he went, tossing his head so the lead rope smacked me in the face. Now, from the outside, this must have been some pretty decent physical comedy. But to a kid whose mind was an expressway to the worst case scenario, this was not funny. I had asked for a pony, and my mom had defrauded the US government to buy me a pony. And not only could I not ride him properly, now I couldn't even catch him. And I would never catch him. He would live out his life in this field, taunting me, while all the other kids took lessons and went to shows and won ribbons and my mom got arrested. Someone called my name. It was a girl named Leslie Stevens, one of the half dozen horse crazy preteens who worked at the barn in exchange for being able to ride whenever she wanted to. She was leaning on the gate, so I walked over, ready to take the mockery that I had coming. This was familiar territory for me. At this stage of my life, my three emotional states were panic, embarrassment, and I'm eating dessert. <laughs> Leslie said, you should shake a can of sweet feet. Now she was standing several yards away, and she had interrupted my catastrophic reverie. So what I heard was, shuck a con, sweet pea. <laughs> I had no response for that. <laughs> Leslie said again, you should shake a can of sweet feed. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so Leslie and I went back to the barn to half fill a coffee can with sweet feed, which in case you don't know is a mixture of corn, oats, and barley bound together with molasses. I think fresh sweet feed is the best smell in the entire world. Adam seemed to like it too, because when I went back out in the field and shook the can, he trotted right up to me. And while he was busy eating the sweet feed out of my hand, I got the halter on him. Bribing Adam with food made me feel like I was living my favorite movie at the time, The Black Stallion. In the movie, a boy and a stallion are shipwrecked on a desert island, and the boy earns the stallion's trust by feeding him seaweed. <laughs> When they get rescued, the boy turns that stallion into a championship racehorse with the help of a wily old trainer played by Mickey Rooney. You don't know who Mickey Rooney is. You might know who Mickey Rooney is. In my life, the role of trainer was played by Karen Lenahan. Karen was a former model who had married into a family that was legendary in Pittsburgh equestrian circles. 
She had lovely bone structure, tan skin, and a silky blonde beard. <laughs> if laser hair removal had been common back then, I believe she would have continued her modeling career instead of spending her days yelling at dozens of little girls and two peeler boys as they bounced around the ring trying not to stare at her facial hair. <laughs> this got harder to do as the day went by because dust from the ring would gather in her beard and form clumps that would shake when she yelled. <laughs> and she yelled a lot. Even when she was a couple steps away from you, her voice was always a couple decibels above comfort level. If you didn't resort to res if you didn't respond to sheer volume, she would resort to torture. <laughs> to strengthen my legs, she made me ride without stirrups. To make me sit up straight, she made me jam put my elbows behind my back and she jammed a crop through there and she made me ride like that. Someday she would take away my reins and make me do balance exercises while she guided Adam in a circle around her with a long rope called the lunge line. The lunge line was the lowest circle of riding hell because all the other kids could see you there in the middle of the ring. <laughs> it was like being in the stocks. Karen was a sort of evil, evil stepmother in my life. From the ages of 10 to 17, I heard her voice in my head yelling at me. Sit up, heels down, relax! <laughs> the pain she caused me even followed me into the shower, where the saddle sores I had forgotten would get scalded by the hot water, and I would wail like a banshee on a roller coaster. If you've never had a saddle sore, Try rubbing your inner calf with sandpaper for about half an hour and then squeeze a lemon onto it. And you'll see what I mean. But Karen wasn't the only one hurting me. Adam had this habit of trying to ram his head into my upper ribs every time I took off the bridle. Now that may not sound like much, but when you consider that a medium pony's head is as hard and as heavy as a bowling ball, it's a real threat. I just assumed that this headbutting was another bad habit that Adam had learned from the disgraced Doug Spink, and most days I sidled out of the way. But one day I was untacking Adam his, in his stall, and my guard was down. And whack, he got me right here so hard my teeth snapped together and I bit my tongue. And without thinking, I jabbed my elbow into his throat. He jerked his head away. The whites of his eyes flashed at me. He cowered in the corner of his stall shaking. He was afraid of me. I was shaking too. I reached out to pat him on the neck and I said, it's okay. But he flinched away from me. I scurried out of the stall, my face on fire with shame. Michael's voice mingling in my head with Karen saying, you don't do that. Every time I felt a throb of pain in my ribs, I bit the part, the place where I bit my tongue and I knew that I deserved it. The next time I took Adam's bridle off, I ran out of the barn before anything bad could happen. The time after that, I stepped out of the way of his tossing head and stood outside the stall, holding still, being quiet, and just watching. I noticed that Adam was rubbing his head against the wall and his stall door and his feed bucket. He tried different angles and gave up with a snort. Adam wasn't evil, he was itchy. So the next time I took off his bridle, I immediately started scratching different places on Adam's face. Wasn't the forehead, or the cheek, or under his chin? And then I found the magic spot just above his left eye socket. I gave it a good scratch and he leaned into me gratefully. As I scratched, tiny hairs and flakes of skin covered my hand. <laughs> Over time, I discovered that it took precisely 39 scratches to soothe Adam after a ride. And he never headbutted me again. If this were a movie, this is where the getting ready montage would be. Because riding, like every other sport, is 99.99% doing the same thing over and over again. Walk, trot, canter.
banter. Oh. <laughs> Writing is also about attaching microphones to yourself. <laughs> and we're moving on. Walk. Trot. Canter. Trot. Canter. 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 Jump. <laughs> canter. 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 Jump. Gallop. Run into fence. <laughs> the montage would also include the endless baths that I gave Adam, which led me to formulate Peeler's Law, stating that the lighter the color of the pony, the more likely that pony is to roll in its own poop. <laughs> About six months after my 10th birthday, the montage was over, and I was ready for my first show with Adam. Here's a picture. Cute, right? The show was at a country club in Swickley Heights. All the shows I competed in were at hunt clubs or country clubs, and the only spectators were horse moms. <laughs> No nonsense women with expensively sensible hair and Gucci purses full of carrots. <laughs> they had all been taught how to behave at a horse show. And it was pretty much the same way you behave at a golf tournament. No sudden movements, no speaking above a murmur. And if something extraordinary happens, do this. I was competing in the pony hunter division which is broken into two types of classes. Over fences, where you go over fences, and under saddle, where you walk, trot, and canter and get judged on how well your pony moves. The over fences classes did not go well. Jumping a course of eight jumps requires a level of subtle and sustained communication that Adam and I just did not have yet. So we won no ribbons over fences. The under saddle class went better, largely because there was less for me to screw up other than one tiny cluck that made him take a turn like a Formula One car, <laughs> I held still and managed to do my best to let Adam show off his walk, trot, and canter. At the end of the class, we joined the other ponies in a line in the middle of the ring to await the judge's decision. After a dramatic pause, the announcer said, in first place, number 17, Adam Ant, owned and ridden by Chris Peeler. I had never won a class before, and everything I knew about winning sporting events, I had learned from watching TV. So when I heard my name, I dropped the reins and went, yes, woo, all right. <laughs> In the Hollywood version of this story, this is where you would hear that needle scratching the record sound. <laughs> Every horse mom turned to glare at the savage from the city who was making such a fuss. And then the announcer said, sorry about that. In first place, it was not number 17. It was number 27. Oh. Number 27, Ferocious Flea, owned and ridden by Tracy Fenster. Not only did I not win, I did not finish in the top six. Oh. Remember before when I was talking about embarrassment being familiar? Oh, yeah. This was very familiar. And the only thing worse than an army of disapproving horse moms glaring at me was the fact that I had to leave the ring and face the wrath of Karen. I tried to brush past her, but who was I kidding? In that too loud voice, she said, don't you ever do that again. <laughs> In every other sport I can think of, a public humiliation like this would have been followed by a decent interval of pouting, maybe some moping, and then maybe some light cursing. But the best thing that Karen taught me was that you always take care of your pony first. So I did not pout or mope or curse. I led Adam back to the section of stalls we had rented for the show. I took off his tack, I hosed him off, and I walked him around the showgrounds until I could put my hand on his chest and it felt cool. Then I led him back to his stall, took off his halter, and gave him a pat on the neck to thank him for taking care of me in our first show together. Then, and only then, was I allowed to take off my helmet and my jacket and hide in the tack room and pout. Oh. <laughs> Michael said that Karen, seeing my abrupt mood swing, 
suggested that I might be a maniac depressive. <laughs> After I'd finished calling myself every bad name I could think of, I was ready to move from the pouting to the moping when I noticed a groom leading a horse down the aisle of the barn. The horse was walking stiffly like it had bad arthritis. My brother was there cleaning a bridle, so I said to him, what's going on with that horse? He's tying up. What's that? If you work him too hard and don't cool him down right, they can get really bad cramps. Will he be okay? As long as he keeps walking, he'll be fine. What if he stops walking? Go clean your tack. So I cleaned and put away my saddle and bridle. And the next time I looked in the aisle, the tying up horse was standing still. The groom was tugging on the lead rope, desperately trying to get him to walk. But he wouldn't. And then the vet came. And then a group of adults circled around the horse. And then the horse fell to the ground. And then they covered him with a tarp. Michael said not to look. Needless to say, I didn't get much sleep that night, and I had some pretty serious questions for Dr. Tabachnik at our next session. He did his best, but telling a 10-year-old that death is a part of the natural order is about as effective as teaching algebra to a squid. <laughs> Luckily, it was spring, so I was busy with show season. Our next show was a bigger, fancier event in Wheeling, West Virginia. When I was growing up, Pittsburgh was a punchline. People made fun of our smog, our dirty rivers, the fact that we put french fries on our sandwiches. As people who were the targets of so much mockery, we needed someone even lower on the totem pole to make fun of. Luckily, we had West Virginia. The ring where we competed in Wheeling was designed as only a West Virginian could. Instead of building the ring on a flat surface or at the top of a hill so that it could drain when it rained, the Wheeling Brain Trust had built their ring so it sat on the bottom of a bowl. And though it was April, a month so famous for showers that somebody wrote a rhyme about it, they were more concerned with dust than with rain. To combat this problem, they had, and I am not making this up, wet down the ring with recycled motor oil. So the thousands of gallons of rain from the inevitable spring downpour on the first day of the show flowed straight to the bottom of the bowl where they mixed with the sand and the oil to form eight inches of viscous sludge through which I was expected to ride my freshly bathed, predominantly white pony. <laughs> my first class at this show was over fences. Now, Adam and I had done a lot of jumping practice since that first show. So despite the rain and the sludge, I felt ready. The key to successfully navigating a course of jumps is to feel your pony's rhythm. And then, using your legs as gas and your hands as brakes, make minor adjustments to your speed so that your takeoff point is neither too close nor too far away from each jump. Finding this takeoff point is called seeing a distance. And it's the hardest thing a hunter rider can do. If you get too close, called getting deep, your pony has to kind of hop over the jump. <coughs> Not very elegant. But if you take off too far away, called getting long, your pony has to stretch and flatten out and may even knock a rail off the jump. A major sin. And hunter courses, as you can see in your program, are broken into four sets of two jumps called lines. And you have to do a set number of strides between these jumps. So. Adam and I jumped the first line smoothly. But when we came around the corner to the third jump, I didn't see a distance till it was too late. So we got really deep. Now I knew we only had six strides before the next jump, so we had to speed up. I squeezed with my legs as hard as I could, and I saw the distance. We were gonna get long, really long. <laughs> Adam and I churned through the rain and the murk and I leaned forward in anticipation of flying over that jump. In the space of those last few strides, I was exhilarated. I was terrified. I was exhilarated again. And then I was falling. Here's what happened. I had seen an impossibly long distance. Adam had seen it too. And he knew that if we took off where I wanted, we would land 
in the middle of the jump. So he did the smart thing and stopped. <laughs> Unfortunately, he didn't have any way to share his plan with me. <laughs> he stopped on one side of the jump, but I flew over it. In the air, I did a half somersault in the pike position. So I landed on my back with my head facing Adam. And because of the rain and the West Virginian design of the ring, I sank so deep in the mud that my mom, who was watching from underneath an umbrella, said my whole body disappeared. <laughs> Luckily, at 10, my bones were still about 70% rubber, so I wasn't hurt. And after a few seconds, I emerged like the creature from the Black Lagoon, <laughs> covered in mud from my leather boots to my wool jacket to my velvet helmet. I sloshed to the other side of the jump where Adam was fidgeting and snorting. He flinched when he saw me as if expecting me to punish him, but I knew this was my fault. Good boy, Adam. We're okay. Good boy. Now, we weren't going to win a ribbon, but we could still salvage some dignity. I was so slimy that my foot slipped out of the stirrup the first few times I tried to get back on. But eventually, I hoisted myself back in the saddle, gathered up the reins, made a nice tidy circle to find the canter, and finished the course. This time, we got deep to every jump. <laughs> On the second day of the show, the rain had stopped, so the ring was sticky instead of sloppy. Borrowing from various friends, I managed to put together a show outfit that wasn't saturated with oil. As Adam and I warmed up for our second over fences class, Karen gave me a refresher course in riding through mud, which mostly consisted of yelling, sit back, every time I approached a jump. <laughs> Sometimes simplicity works. With Karen's voice in my head, I found a nice sprightly canter, and Adam and I jumped the first six jumps perfectly in stride. And then we came to the last line. I got a little deep to the first jump, so here we were again, needing some speed. I sat back, and I squeezed, and Adam churned through that sticky mud. We were perfectly in sync this time, but we were really long. Adam launched himself over that jump, tucking his feet up to his chin, and for an instant closing his eyes. I closed my eyes too. How do I know Adam closed his eyes? Because the ringside photographer got a picture of it. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Here we are, flying blind through the air, <laughs> soaring above the oily mud, and trusting each other that we would land safely on the other side. And we did. And as we made a circle that took us from a canter to a walk, even Karen was clapping. <laughs> I came out of the ring and went over to Karen for the postmortem. I was, I was huffing and puffing more than Adam was. She looked concerned and said, what's wrong? <laughs> I think I forgot to breathe. <laughs> and this time, when the announcer said I had won the class, it was no mistake. But I hadn't earned my prize yet, because another one of the rules of hunter competitions is that all the ribbon winners have to dismount and jog their ponies into the ring to prove that they haven't gone lame in the course of jumping over eight fences. <laughs> and that's how all my borrowed clothes got covered in mud, too. <laughs> This time, I did not throw my hands in the air, but instead did the proper, humble thing. When I got a few feet from the man with the awards, I doffed my helmet, and I smiled, and I thanked him as he handed me my first blue ribbon. Adam and I would go on to win more classes together, but where we truly excelled was placing second. <laughs> Hunter shows are scored on a point system, 
At each show, a pony competes in three to five classes, and you get five points for first, three points for second, two points for third, one point for fourth. At the end of the show, the pony with the most total points is crowned champion. And the runner-up is the reserve champion. Adam and I won a lot of reserve champions in our years together. When you're champion, you get a big, shiny, engraved trophy. When you're reserve champion, you get something straight from the regifting drawer. <laughs> For example, I'm pretty sure I was the only 11-year-old boy in Pittsburgh who had his own crystal cake plate. <laughs> but I did learn an important lesson from a system where you get five points for first and three points for second. It's better to finish second twice than first once. By my second summer with Adam, I had stopped going to Dr. Tabachnik. I'm sure the good doctor told my mom that uh, he had provided me with a set of mental tools to help me manage my nighttime death panic. But the truth was more mundane. Now, when I lay in bed and did my mom's relaxation technique, as I tried to sink each body part into the bed, I heard Karen's voice in my head yelling at me what I was doing wrong with that body part. It was just slightly less frightening than death. So I could sleep. For many years, I had a video of me and Adam from this summer. It shows us jumping in in and out, which is a line with only one stride between the jumps. As we jump the first jump, I lose my stirrup and therefore my balance. So when we land, I am on my way to falling off the right side. That's when, in the space of a single stride, Adam makes a little juke to the right, catches me, and gathers himself in time to take the second <laughs> jump perfectly in stride. That video was the Zapruder film that proved <laughs> Adam's greatness. <laughs> Years later, when I couldn't find a box that had that video along with a Roberto Clemente baseball card that would have paid for a small house. It was the video I really missed. By our third summer together, Adam and I were well known on the hunter circuits of Western Pennsylvania and Ohio. In a world dominated by little girls traipsing around on their pedigreed ponies, a boy who zipped over fences on a smiling four-hooked rugby player, <laughs> and who very often came in second, was something to see. Let's just say that word of our exploits had reached as far west as Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> it was in Michigan that I met Ruth Ann Neely, who was so pretty she made me forget how gross her name was. <laughs> she rode a large pony, and she had that 80s haircut where it's cut short in the back to show off her neck, but the front was a glorious swoop of chestnut bangs that would cover her eyes if she let it. And she had these pouty lips that scared me a little. <laughs> the last show of the season ended with a big exhibitor's party, which gave us riders a chance to get out of our sweaty boot boots and britches and into some serious 80s fashions. I had mushroom-colored pants by Bugle Boy that were pleated and tapered. And when you rolled them up, they showed a pattern on the cuff. And I had a blue polo, by polo, that would have been big on an actual polo pony. Ruth Ann was in acid wash guest jeans, a neon green leather belt, and a pink Oxford with the collar popped. Seeing her out of context like this was surreal, and I must have stared. My staring was interrupted by another girl our age, Jennifer Lemon, who offered me a sip of her fuzzy navel. <laughs> it wouldn't be accurate to say that I was popular with girls, but in a room where there were 10 girls to every boy, I could at least be used as practice. <laughs> as I was politely declining Jennifer's drink, Ruth Ann appeared at my elbow, jiggling a set of keys. Want to go for a ride on my scooter? She said, I did. <laughs> so we walked out of the party, and she mounted the pink moped that she used to get around the showgrounds. I got on behind her, making sure to leave a good six inches between us. 
Hold on, she said. <laughs> to me, she said. And I did. And we zoomed off into the night. We ended up back at the barn, outside her pony's stall. We patted him for a while and told him what a good boy he was. And then I sat down on a tack trunk. And she sat right next to me. I mean, her guesses were touching my bugle boys. <laughs> She turned to me, and she flicked the hair out of her eyes. Her leg pressed against my leg, rock solid from hundreds of hours in the saddle. Maybe we should get back to the party. <laughs> we can't, she said. I ran out of gas. Isn't there some around here? I thought I saw a can. There's no can. Let's just sit. We sat. I didn't breathe. I was scared. Or was it some new kind of excitement that felt a lot like fear? And then she turned to me, and she flicked the hair out of her eyes, and she tilted her head to the side, and she pursed those lips. Are you sure you're out of gas? Let's go check. She had done her best, but the spell was broken. It was a long, lonely walk back to the party. What Ruth Ann didn't know was that I had never kissed a girl before, and I had only ever seen people making out on TV in close-up. So the story I told myself was that I would have kissed her, but I just didn't know what I was supposed to do with my hands. I wondered what my granddaddy would have told me, and I decided that I needed to hold still, be quiet, and just watch people kissing. If a girl ever let me on her scooter again, I would be ready. <laughs> In the fall, after the circuit was over, Adam and I would sometimes unwind from the discipline of showing and lessons by going back to that same field where I first rode him. After a few years with me, he was less inclined to gallop. So one brisk fall day, we had a nice canter. And as a special treat, I let him put his head down and pluck some of the tall grass that grew around the field. It started to rain, so we trotted back to the barn. I untacked him, and I hosed off the sweat where the saddle had been, and walked him around the courtyard a bit. As we walked back to the stall, I noticed he was walking stiffly. So I took him back out to the courtyard. Mom called the vet. And as I kept Adam moving, Michael put a light blanket on him, hoping that the warmth would loosen him up. My brain was going a million miles an hour. Should I not have cantered so fast? Was it the grass? Should I not have hosed him off? Did I not cool him down properly? As we walked in circle after circle around the courtyard, I was talking the whole time. Come on, Adam. Good boy. Let's go for a walk. Good boy. And then he stopped walking. I wished that I had said or done something heroic, but I didn't. I just looked at the spot on his shoulder where my hands usually rested when I rode him. I tried to start walking as if nothing was wrong, but Adam just stood there. Come on, Adam. I pulled on the lead rope again, but he wouldn't move. I pulled on the lead rope. I, I pushed his shoulder. I had been taught to be polite no matter what, so I said, please, and I tugged on the lead rope. And he took a step, and then another, and we were walking. In tiny, tight steps, we were walking. When the vet came, he watched Adam for a minute and said, just bring him over here and I'll give him a shot. We can't stop walking. <laughs> oh, don't worry, it'll just take a minute. Can't you do it while he's moving? No, I really can't. It'll just take a second. So I held Adam still while the vet stuck an enormous syringe into his shoulder. And it helped right away. This time, when I pulled on the lead rope, Adam started walking with his normal bouncy stride. I patted him and patted him. Thank you, I said. Thank you, thank you, thank you. By my fourth summer, with Adam, 
I was almost as big on him as Doug Spink had been. Meanwhile, my brother had completely outgrown his pony, Millie, who had been for sale for months. So at the Chagrin Valley Hunt Club Horse Show, I was riding Adam and Millie too to show her off for potential buyers. Now, Millie, in pony hunter terms, was fancier than Adam. She was more refined looking, a better mover, smoother over jumps. And because she and Adam were both medium ponies, they were competing head to head at this show. On the first day of the show, I got a first and a second with each of them, which meant that they were tied with how many points? More, more than that? Eight, Eight yes. Eight championship points. I was the king of the medium pony division. <laughs> that night, in the hotel room we shared, Michael told me that a 10-year-old girl named Avery and her family were interested in buying Millie. They were coming to the show the next day. Now, Michael didn't say anything about how badly we needed the money, and my mom never would. But I knew that there was more than a ribbon at stake this time. It all came down to one last over fences class. I rode Adam first. People talk about butterflies in your stomach. I had pterodactyls. <laughs> but as soon as we got in the ring, they just disappeared. And Adam and I just floated around that course. It felt completely effortless. And it must have looked pretty good, too, because when we were finished, Karen clapped so hard her beard shook. <laughs> when I got on Millie, the pterodactyls came back. And she could sense it. Her head darted around, and she tugged on the bridle in a way that she never had before. We jumped a couple of practice jumps, and Karen said, that'll have to do. <laughs> As I was standing waiting to go in the ring, I saw my mom talking to a grim-faced woman I didn't recognize. I trotted Millie into the ring, and as we picked up a canter, she stretched out her neck and let out a <laughs> I had never had a pony do that in a class before, and it threw me. The rest of Millie's round was the opposite of Adam's. We were too fast, then we were too slow, we were too long, then we were too deep. When we came out of the ring, the grim-faced woman was gone. Millie didn't get a ribbon, but Adam won that class. So Millie was reserve champion. But Adam, the scrappy little underdog, was champion. And honestly, that one part of the story is exactly as it would have been in the Hollywood version. <laughs> Here's a picture of the three of us that day. When I came out of the ring, I handed Millie off to Michael and walked Adam back to the barn with that big championship ribbon waving in the breeze. Now this was partly so he could cool down, but mainly so I could say my quiet, humble thanks to one of a dozen jealous tween girls who congratulated me on my double win. I had never had a weekend like that before, and I never would again. When we got back to the barn, my mom was waiting for us. She said that the grim-faced woman was Avery's mom and that they didn't want to buy Millie. I'm sorry, I said. Mom rested her hand on Adam's neck. But the thing is, they do want to buy Adam. What? No! I pictured jumping on Adam and galloping away, but I couldn't imagine how the two of us could survive alone in Ohio. <laughs> I know it's a shock, but you know you're getting too big for him. He needs someone smaller. Adam was standing right there, so I wasn't going to yell or scream or cry. When do they want to take him? Avery's coming by in a few minutes to say hello. And she gave us both a hug and left us alone. I turned to that face that I had washed and scratched and sometimes secretly kissed and said, you were such a good boy today. And it's going to be so much better for you to be ridden by someone small again. I wanted him to wear his championship ribbon for as long as possible, so I kept the bridle on as I gave him one last bath. As I was drying him off, a tiny blonde girl walked up. 
Hi, I'm Avery, she said, and her three front teeth fell out. <laughs> she took the teeth out of her mouth and held them out to me. They're fake. The real ones got knocked out in a car crash. My older brother, Ted, died. Can I pat him? <gasps> sure. Go ahead. She ran her hand down Adam's neck. I've always wanted a little white pony. He's a medium gray pony. <laughs> Let me show you something. I walked Adam into his stall with Avery a couple, couple feet behind me, and I eased off the bridle, and I scratched that magic spot above his left eye socket, watching the snowy white hairs fall from his head one last time. You have to do this 39 times or he'll headbutt you. <laughs> I finished scratching and came out of the stall. Avery just kept looking at me and fidgeting with her fake teeth. So I said, were you scared in the car crash? I don't remember. But I could see the dark circles under her eyes. She needed Adam more than I did. Avery's family wanted to take Adam that day. So I was feeding him his third carrot of the day when somebody called my name. It was Leslie Stevens. Remember the girl with the sweet feed? And she had Adam's special traveling halter in her hand. You guys ready to go, she said. She held out the halter to me, but I couldn't stop patting Adam's cheek, his shoulder, the spot on his neck where I had rested my hands as we had flown over so many jumps together. You want me to take him over? She said. I didn't trust myself to talk, so I nodded. I gave Adam one last pat and watched Leslie put the halter on him and lead him out of the stall. Good boy, I said. And something was wrong with my lungs and my throat and my eyes. I watched Adam walk away. And then I found myself watching Leslie walk away. <laughs> she had long hair the color of caramel and really excellent posture. <laughs> Watching her, I felt something entirely new and yet somehow familiar. I was exhilarated. I was terrified. I was exhilarated again. And then I was falling. I wanted to find out all her favorite things in the world and give them to her, one a day for as long as it took. About a week later, I had the best dream of my life about Leslie. <laughs> we were having a party in the house where we lived together. She was talking to one group of friends, and I was talking to another group of friends. And then she came over and pressed her cheek against my cheek and said, why don't you come help me do the dishes? And I was home. In the Hollywood version of this whole story, I would have shared a first kiss with Leslie in the moonlight, somewhere in Chagrin Falls or Sewickley Heights. I never even held her hand. But thanks to the pony who brought us together, I was imagining scenarios that were not at all worst case. And for a maniac depressive from Mars, that was real progress. Thank you very much. Thank you.